Excellencies, dear friends, colleagues, and esteemed guests, I'm honored to welcome you at the Good Governance Forum 2024. It's an international annual event that since its inception in 2019 stands as a testament to our collective commitment to promoting good governance at local, regional, and global scales. Well, I'm Georgi Kaldiashvili, uh, Executive Director of IDFI, Institute for Development of Freedom of Information, and on behalf of IDFI, I would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to all of you who have gathered here in Tbilisi, Georgia, and to those who have joined us virtually. So this is the hybrid conference, uh, and I'm especially welcoming those who managed to travel to Georgia. Well, before starting the conference, I want to express my deep condolences to the families and friends of those who have tragically lost their lives due to the landslides in Achara and Imereti regions, as well as tragic developments in Asureti village. Hope, so we hope that people still missing will be found safe and quickly. Uh, now we can get back to our forum, uh, which is generously supported by the Swedish International Development Cooperation Agency, SIDA, and co-supported by United Nations Development Program, UNDP, the UK government, USAID National Governance Program, USAID Economic Governance Program, uh, UN Women Georgia, the EU Global Facility on Anti-Money Laundering and Combating finan uh, Financing Terrorism Program, and the Open Free Government Partnership. It is. And the Open Government Partnership. So it promises to be a platform of rich discourse and shared learnings. Well, now I have several technical uh, in notes to share. Our event is conducted online via Zoom and is also live streamed. Virtual participants can pose their questions through Zoom and we will try to address them. Furthermore, in our commitment to environmental sustainability, we have opted not to print any materials on paper this time. All information about the forum and the agenda is available online through QR codes displayed on the badges and on the cube located on the stage. Now, back to the forum. Since 2019, the Good Governance Forum was supported by the global philanthropic organization Luminate and co-sponsored in different years by GIZ, USAID, local government program in Georgia, and covered a bit of topics. In 2019, anti-corruption monitoring and institutional solutions to combating corruption, beneficial ownership transparency, the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, EITI, public procurement and open contracting. In 2020, political integrity, party financing, transparency, and elections. In 2021, sustainable governance of natural resources. In 2022, decentralization and local governance. In 2023, enlargement package initiated by the European Commission marked a historic milestone for Georgia and our friends in Eastern Europe and the Balkan states. The journey towards EU integration demands an in, uh, uh, instigation and numerous reforms in our respective countries. At the core of this progression lies the crucial exchange of best practices intervened with dialogue addressing common challenges, opportunities, and obstacles. This is the reason why we choose the topic of advancing good governance, best practices, and challenges on the path toward the EU integration as a topic for this year's forum. And I believe that our GG Forum 2024 can serve as an effective catalyst for positive developments. Building upon the aforementioned points, our panel discussions will delve uh, into a range of critical issues, including combating corruption, preventing and countering organized crime and money laundering, initiating public administration reform, mainstreaming gender and good governance reforms, exploring innovation, innovative mechanisms to combating corruption and enhance comp competition and civil 
society engagement in reforms. Considering the diversity of topics and the, uh, in the spirit of inclusivity and collaboration, the forum gathers stakeholders from various fields fostering and comprehensive multi-stakeholder approach. Distinguished speakers representing expertise from Georgia, Ukraine, Republic of Moldova, Balkan countries, EU candidates, EU member countries, and the United States will contribute to the inclusive di the discourse, ensuring that the topics addressed uh, encompass the interest of all involved parties. Our special gratitude to the speakers from Ukraine, Slava Ukraini, we, pray, we really appreciate your effort to travel to Georgia, and I want to thank our online participants, and we hope that to see you in Tbilisi at our future Good Governance Forums. Once again, thank you for being here and making this gathering even more special. Thank you very much. And now I have the honor to extending the floor to an opening remarks to His Excellency Mark Layton, the esteemed British Ambassador to Georgia. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and it is uh, so good to see so many people here in the room. And I know we'll have lots of people online as well. So welcome. And let me join you, uh, Georgi, in extending condolences to all those who've lost their lives across Georgia in the last day or so. Um, those are tragic events. Uh, but in a way, uh, they also relate to what we're talking about today because the government responds to those, whether it's local or national, is at the core of what we're discussing, good governance. So I wanted to spend a few words, spend a little bit of time just talking about that. I think the first thing that I would say is um, the issue of good governance on a personal level is, is close to my heart. So here in Georgia, I've got a fancy label. Uh, I've got the ambassador title. And then if I get beyond that, people think I'm a diplomat. Bottom line is, for the UK, I am a civil servant. I'm a civil servant like so many people in this room. And so m it's my core job to deliver public services on behalf of the democratically elected government of the day. So I get invited to speak at many events, and some of those things that I talk about, I am way off. You know, I am not a conflict-affected woman working, uh, living along the ABL. But when it comes to good governance, I am a civil servant. I have worked my whole career delivering public services, so I really get the focus of this event, and I get the importance of this. Because I think at the end of the day, we talk about gov governance in relatively abstract terms, but this is an issue, this is an area that affects everyone's lives. And to me, good governance is at the heart of that democratic deal, that contract between the citizen and their elected representatives. It's at the core of, it's at the core of democracy because what do people want when they elect people? They want... Uh, people who can make decisions on their behalf, get this, you know, deliver the services that they want as part of that democratic process, make sure that their taxes are spent effectively. So whether that is schooling provision, pension delivery, medical support, rubbish collection in Tbilisi or anywhere else, this is all part of that contract between the citizen and government and their electric um, representatives. So you have to get it right. And that to me is why get this issue is so important. I think when it comes to Georgia, this is also crucial. To me, it is at the heart of Georgia's progress and the reform progress um, as Georgia progresses towards EU and NATO membership. Um, good governance, delivery of uh, services is core to that to making that progress. And that's why, from a UK perspective, it's so important for us, be that in Georgia or actually across the world. Um, we issued a, an integrated review on our defense security development policy not so long ago. It's the, gov it's the document that ca uh, catalogues the UK's approach to foreign development and security policy. And in setting out the goals of that review, our Prime Minister was very clear. You know, um, we are in an age of global uh, competition. Um, 
and unless democracies like our own do more, those that are driving global instability, the global uh, security situation will deteriorate further and that will be all of our loss. So getting this right is a core part of tackling the global situation and global instability. So here in Georgia, one of our objectives is to support um, Georgia develop more robust democratic institutions and adherence to the principles of human rights, gender equality and media freedom. And through the programs that we deliver, we do a lot of that. Um, so first of all, you'll hear later today about the um, public administration reform program that we deliver in partnership with UNDP. Um, I've had some of the some of the best conversations I've had have been with the Civil Service Bureau and the administration of government. And that's because, you know, I'm doing their job, they're doing my job, we bounce ideas, we share experiences, um, and we tackle common problems in a spirit of partnership, which is what our, uh, our relationship with Georgia is all about. There's a lot of talk, and there will be a lot of talk across the next couple of days about public service delivery. One thing that I would add into the mix is um, the importance of defense and security reform. There's a lot of talk in, over the next couple of days about the public service delivery. I think it is absolutely crucial that that service delivery is inclusive, that it reaches out to minorities, LGBTQ community and others, and it's effectively spread right across Georgia. But one of the best bits of the work that we've done over many years here in Georgia is actually with your Ministry of Defense. You know, that is a public administration reform program, but in a particular sector. And they have made tremendous progress in um, transparency, gender equality, and accountability. That is all core to both the EU uh, progress, where oversight of you know, effective security uh, sector is a core part of one of the nine steps. It's also critical to NATO membership. We're working with NDI to uh, improve parliamentary oversight and support Parliament's work in developing legis and scrutinizing legislation. We're working on the um, climate law in Parliament with the Westminster Foundation and, uh, for Democracy. And we're also supporting with EBRD the um, Investors' Council, which again is a core element of that dialogue between communities, the business community in this case, and government, to make sure that government responds to the needs of all the different communities across Georgia. So I think I'll, I'll draw it to a close there. The bottom line is there is a lot going on. Collectively in this room, everyone will be delivering to this agenda. It is at the heart of Georgia's ongoing reform programs, which are essential for progress towards EU and NATO uh, membership. And the UK is really proud to be part of that. So I wish you all the very best for the next couple of days. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Clayton, especially for your invaluable and generous support to Georgia. And I would like to pass the floor, and I'm pleased, to uh, Mr. Uh, uh, sorry. <laughs> Douglas Webb, I'm really sorry, uh, acting UNDP uh, uh, resident representative in Georgia. Thanks, Georgi. Uh, one of the hazards of being novel, I guess. I, remain, I want to remain novel for as long as I can. I've learned it's an asset. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, thank you. Uh, and also, on behalf of the UN family, condolences for the tragic events over the last few days. Um, um, welcome to what will be a I hope a fascinating discussion over the next um, couple of days um, with all our partners and welcome to, of course, to our fellow um, UN colleagues and our ambassadors and thanks to IDFI for organizing the conversation um, with government partners and CSOs. A few uh, sort of introductory comments. Um, firstly, on EU accession. Um, which is essentially a political decision. Now, as far as the, the UN is, of, of course, concerned, once the political pathway is, is decided or set, um, this then for us becomes essentially a technical conversation. Um, how do we then build the, the political, um, go beyond the political discussion to a technocratic environment where the human infrastructure 
is there, the technical infrastructure, the, the, the resource base, the standards are in place to realize that, that political um, ambition. Um, the institutional capacities and capabilities are in place. This is, the, in a sense, the job of the UN. We take intention and we realize it. We, har in a sense, harass in a polite way. Okay, you want to do it? How are you going to do this? And that's, a, that's our role. Always building on, on principles of in inclusion, respect, human rights, and the rule of law. And these are universals everywhere, all the time, irrespective of place, time, where you happen to be in the election cycle. Those are, those are in a sense, our details. Okay? So we consistently engage in pushing on those principles and platforms. The discussions are important here because this isn't a, a lone path that George is taking, of course. The collaboration with other states walking the same way is going to be important with other the Balkans and Eastern Partnership. So kudos in a sense to have the conversations um, with other experts from OECD, Transparency International, think tanks. Uh, CSOs, Ukraine, Moldova, Western Balkans, etc. That shared experience, recognizing the challenges, the non-linearities uh, of the progress, and and that engagement that, that Mark mentioned, and the the backwards and forwards, and the, the in a sense making some tough choices about where assets and resources uh, should be um, prioritized. The topics, transparency, anti-corruption, prevention of money laundering, all our favorite subjects, stuff that we read up on at weekends. But I mean, I mean, let's be honest, I mean, some of the most development, some of the most effective development assistance is, is actually the prevention of the wastage and loss of resources which are already in the system. It's not the addition of new resources. It's stopping those already there from going down the drain. In a sense, those things are the human condition in an institutional form. And, you know, our job, UNDP, we love that stuff. It's not glamorous. It's the grunt work. It's the machine. When people ask me what we do in UNDP, we say, well, we do all the dirty stuff behind the scenes. In a sense, we're proud of that. And thanks for the partners for coming along with us. And in the sense, the UK in the, in the public assistance reform process, public administration reform. So finally, CSOs. And without your critical role in this, the witnessing, the holding to account, the service provision at critical times and bringing the voices of the marginalized into that conversation. We cannot do this without your engagement. So let's have a really robust and interesting dialogue. This is a really important forum, the fifth forum. Right? Yeah, good. Let it long continue and we're happy to be involved. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Webb, uh, especially for your support uh, in various fields, as you have mentioned, and it's really invaluable support that UNDP is uh, providing for Georgia. Now, uh, I would like to extend the floor to Mr. Nicholas Sandrovich, the head of cooperation at the EU delegation to Georgia. <laughs> Thank you very much, Georgi. Um, so in line with what other people are saying, my name is Nick Sendrovich, and I'm a civil servant. Um, I'm actually very proud of being a civil servant, um, because like you, I have two 
roles. One is um, service delivery to citizens, and secondly, driving the reforms which are going to um, make all of our lives better. And I think that that's something which I share with quite a lot of the people in the room, and I'm going to come back to that a little bit later. Um, firstly, it's my pleasure to welcome you here. Um, good morning to all. Mogesal uh, Mabit, on behalf of the EU delegation to Georgia, and I'd like to thank uh, IDFI for inviting us. Of course, we would also extend our deep condolences to the victims of the, um, the tragedies here in, uh, in Georgia over the past uh, few days. Um, so this is the fifth edition of the Governance Forum, and it comes at an important moment for Georgia and its relations with the European Union. Um, Georgia's European aspirations and the European choice of the Georgian people have been firm, formally uh, confirmed, and that, that's the good news. We all very much enjoyed the celebrations here in Tbilisi at the end of last year. Um, but now it's the morning after, and having received the candidate status, um, it is time to intensify our common work and deliver on Georgia's European integration commitments. Um, the same is true for our relations with all of our neighborhood and enlargement partners. And in that, support for good governance reforms has been a crucial objective of EU's external relations, and particularly in an enlargement policy context, is actually what we call one of the uh, fundamentals, part of the common values on which the EU is built. So democracy, respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms, gender equality, and the rule of law. And on top of this, public institutions and administrations need to be responsive to societal concerns. They have to be effective in delivering policies and have a strong citizen-focused delivery of services. Um, those institutions and administrations are expected to be more agile, digital, innovative, uh, and green. Fighting corruption and minimizing the threats to integrity are going to build the trust in governments. Um, respect for human rights goes hand in hand with building inclusive societies. From the EU side, we're going to continue to support our enlargement partners. That includes Georgia, of course, now. Welcome to that club. Uh, on their reform path and through a wide-ranging cooperation covering many areas of good governance, development of civil society, building and strengthening institutions, public administration and civil service reform, and fighting against uh, corruption. We are also cooperating in the areas of just, uh, freedom, security, and justice, um, and gender equality, reducing the gap between men and women uh, when it comes to employment and access to services and so many other areas is written into the DNA of everything that we do. Um, we are providing an awful lot of assistance in this area, but we're also engaged in uh, policy dialogue. This starts with our work with Georgia to implement the nine steps that Georgia is going to have to fulfill if it advances to the next stage of the uh, European integration process. Um, most of these nine steps can actually be linked to good governance. Um, and all of this is going to be performed in close dialogue with the government, but also all political forces and our international partners. Above all, we're going to be engaging with civil society in what we do, as we firmly believe that engaging with civil society is not only a question of democratic legitimacy, but it is also quite simply good policy making. Today, we all have the opportunity to share experiences from different countries, presenting good practices, but also uh, learning from those which were less good um, discussing the remaining challenges and gaps. Um, it is really important to, to learn from each other, particularly from those countries that are perhaps a little bit further down the path of their European integration, or even those which have already joined the EU and can share those experiences. So with that, I wish everybody a fruitful discussion and collaborations, which I'm sure are going to emerge 
from uh, this workshop, leading to a better understanding of the practical steps taken by all countries in their EU integration uh, journey. Thank you very much for that. Thank you very much, Nicholas. Uh, well, uh, thank you also for your insights and uh, uh, mentioning that getting the status is not the end, it's just the beginning and we really have to work a bit to, to go further and I think our forum will contribute to that. So thank you once again and to you delegation and you for the enormous support to Georgia. Now I'd like to ask Mr. Eric Illis, who is the head of the development cooperation and the deputy head of mission of Sweden in Georgia. And I would like to use this opportunity and mention that we have the main support from CEDA as the organization and this forum would be impossible without the support of CEDA. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jorgen, and uh, welcome, everybody. And it's really my honor to welcome you all to this 2024 Forum on Good Governance. And uh, I want to extend a special thank you to IDF 5 and all of you who have been uh, engaged in uh, putting the agenda together. Uh, it's a very fruitful and, and interesting program, and the timing of the conference is, is really perfect. Uh, as we heard that Georgia has become a candidate country for membership towards uh, in, in the European Union and uh, on the understanding of nine steps and uh, uh, one would argue that all these nine steps relates to good governance and um, uh, good governance is and, and has to uh, remain in the DNA of, uh, of the European Union and hence in the uh, in the uh, European integration process and um, I, 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 I'm, I'm also a civil servant. I'm a Swedish civil servant. <laughs> I'm very proud of that. And uh, uh, looking at the public administration within uh, the European Union, there are different cultures. But it has to be, it be based on, on the same core principles. And in the case of Sweden, we have a tradition of highly independent government agencies. And, uh, and when we have new governments, this also always uh, stirs a bit of commotion uh, because new governments want to do new things and we need to remind them that there are laws there are ordinances so there are key principles you cannot argue like and, uh, I have to quote Marx not Karl Marx but Crouch Marx said uh, I have my principles if you don't like them well I have others uh, these are codified principles institutionalized principles very important for me as a civil servant and um, we know that uh, Good governance sets sort of the fundamental principles, rules, and structures that fosters trust, cooperation, innovation, predictability, and transparency, and ultimately also resilience. It addresses these root uh, causes of discrimination and inequality, and good governance matters to people, and it's been mentioned by previous speakers as well, not at least to the disadvantaged, because it affects well-being, rights, and uh, opportunities and dignity. And we're all aware that we live in a time when good governance uh, principles are increasingly under pressure and attack uh, by authoritarian forces. And these are gaining momentum and, uh, and also to some extent increased popular support. Uh, this means that good governance can certainly not be taken for granted. And in our efforts to uh, advance good governance, this new context needs to be uh, very well understood and recognized. And it requires adapted strategies on the ways of how we work, how we work together, and how we communicate uh, good governance principles and the importance of it. I think that this forum is a great opportunity to, uh, to learn from each other and to face challenges, look into them, and to find solutions. And I hope that these days will be uh, inspiring for everyone and help us to become even more effective in enabling the advance of these reforms. And I'm eager to hear from every one of you and dialogue with you throughout these days. So thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Eric. Uh, 
we, we definitely need the independent institution, the um, public institutions, and probably this is something that is really need to be reformed in Georgia. And I'm really happy that in the nine steps and recommendations, we have this as one of the key points. So I hope that we can contribute to this process from the civil society perspective. It's, it's a challenging because uh, uh, civil society is not considered uh, today as the main partner of the government and it's, it's a challenge that we need to somehow work about but we still from inside or from outside we do our best to contribute to the process, provide the recommendations, our insights and I hope once again that this forum will be a flooring platform for this type of discussion and dialogue. Thank you once again. Um, and last but certainly not least, I would like to welcome Ms. Corinne Rothblum, Deputy Director, Office of Democracy, Rights and Governance, DRG, USAID Georgia, to share her perspectives with us. Thank you, Georgi. Um, thank you, ambassadors, colleagues, friends. I'm, I'm cognizant that I'm the last civil servant standing between you and what really is the heart of this meeting, so I'll try to keep my remarks brief. And honestly, there's really not much that I can add to what, what those who spoke before me have said. Um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to, to represent USAID and to be a sponsor of this very important discussion. Um, forums like this are really an important opportunity for policymakers to benefit from the specialized knowledge and expertise that all of you in the room have to share and to engage, to demonstrate how in constructive engagement with civil society and thought leaders is so crucial in policy making, good governance, and for charting a path towards Georgia's European future. So as someone who has worked in, not just as a civil servant in my current capacity, but also in local government for a number of years in the US, I have a real appreciation for the importance of opportunities like this that bring together experts to share ideas, puzzle through challenges, and come away sort of reinvigorated about why we do this work every day. It's not easy. It's the grunt work, as, as I think uh, has been acknowledged by others, but it's very important. Picking up that rubbish really matters to citizens. I noted that they have some new rubbish bins in Bakke Park, which have stirred a little bit of conversation in social media. Um, Georgia has made great strides in public administration reform, particularly with respect to developing and adopting strategies to enhance government performance, and it rightfully serves as a regional model. So the ongoing uh, reforms that have already been achieved, key milestones include this initial phase of civil service reform, which is so important, the establishment of a policy planning and coordination system to deliver evidence-based policy making and very importantly, the enactment of a public procurement law last year that brings procurement practices in Georgia in compliance with the EU Directive on Public Procurement. This is, as we all know, one of the greatest leakage points in which public resources can go astray. So the implementation of this new reform, I think, is going to be a really critical part of the good governance pathway going forward. So for over two decades, USAID has proudly partnered with the Georgian government, with civil society, and other stakeholders to help advance these reforms, to strengthen democratic institutions, and to support the growth of Georgia's vibrant civil society. We support good governance and EU integration in a myriad of ways, but I will just focus on a couple of our current ongoing programs and offer a couple of examples. Our national governance program, which is a, a, a co-sponsor of this event today, um, is an important uh, methodology for doing that. And through it, USAID is continuing to make sustained investments in public administration reform, institutional integrity, and citizen engagement. In the first year of the program, USAID supported the Civil Service Bureau to restructure its operations to reflect its revised mandate, enhance its analytical capacity for monitoring and reinforce its key oversight function to ensure a merit-based public service. And this merit-based public service, again, I think is foundational to advancing good governance in every country that we work in and are from ourselves. 
We're proud to collaborate with the National Center for Educational Quality Enhancement in aligning its benchmarks with EU standards for public administration programs. And this will enable almost 30 programs in public administration at higher education institutions across Georgia to help educate the next generation of civil servants who will really chart a path towards continuing um, Georgia's EU integration. At the local level, our local governance program is partnering with 22 municipalities across Georgia to strengthen service delivery, oversight mechanisms, and critically, to enhance the modalities through which citizens can engage in voicing their needs and priorities to government and help provide accountability for the delivery of important public services. So in closing, EU candidacy, again, I'm stating the obvious that has been said by all who came before me, is a really unique opportunity for all Georgians, government, the thought leaders like you in this room, civic activists, and others to achieve Georgia's future. And USAID, like all of the other development partners that are represented here today, are committed to supporting this continued journey. And I just, I'm sorry that I won't be able to personally attend all of the rich conversations over the next two days. Um, these are really important discussions, and uh, I wish you all the best in them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Corinne, for your insights and for the listing of all those, uh, uh, all those projects and uh, support that USAID is doing. But it's not the whole list. USAID is supporting Georgia in various directions, not only good governance, but economy, it might be agriculture, etc., etc. So it's the enormous support that we have from U.S. government and U.S. people. So thank you once again. And with this, we are closing the opening remarks. And I would like to thank you all for your valuable insights and support. And please join me once again in this gratitude to, to, to our supporters, and not only for the support of this forum, but also for sharing your very interesting and important insights. And now we have the, f the first panel, the main very interesting panel that centers on fighting corruption, especially delving into the European Union's recommendations for combating corruption. In this panel, we'll focus on the unique challenges faced by uh, participating countries exploring their achievements in the context of EU integration and discussing future measures. I'm delighted that Ms. Tina Hidashelli, chairperson of Civic IDEA, former Minister of Defense of Georgia and former MP and chair of Committee of EU Integration of the Parliament of Georgia, with her extensive experience in this field, will be moderating the panel. Her expertise ensures a smooth and engaging flow for our discussion on combating corruption and I would like to say that Tina is the lecturer of, of IDFI's uh, university program on corruption. So thank you very much for your cooperation, Tina. The floor is yours, and please invite. <laughs> okay. Speakers of the yes. Thank you, Georgi. Thank you for having me here. And um, good morning, everybody. Uh, may I ask my speakers to join me at the panel, and I will introduce all of them to you. Okay, um, I think we can start. Um, well, as British ambassador set the tone for the discussions, I unfortunately had an 
honor of being civil servant only for two short years in the beginning of 90s, um, which, um, which was actually very challenging and interesting times of for Georgia after gaining independence, uh, first parliamentary elections, starting uh, setting up democratic institutions, uh, obviously involved setting the civil service as well. And um, that was my honor to be part of parliamentary team of the first young uh, just graduated uh, lawyers who've been helping uh, the Georgian parliament in, in the beginning of the 90s to create various departments, the whole bureaucracy, setting up the committees and the entire system. Unfortunately, it is 2024 and we are still talking about the deficiencies in the civil service. Um, we are still talking about the problems. We are still talking about the reforms needed, progress uh, that needs to be proven uh, by Georgia. But um, civil service is not our topic of discussion today. Let me first introduce my wonderful panel and I'm absolutely delighted to have you all here uh, joining um, us today. Uh, the um, uh, first from, um, from my, um, what is it left, <laughs> is um, Rusudan Michelidze uh, that I have pleasure of knowing uh, when he was Georgian civil servant still uh, from those, uh, those times. Today, Rusudan is the head of the monitoring of the OECD anti-corruption network for Eastern Europe and Central Asia, an outreach program of the Working Group on Bribery in International Business Transactions with the Secretary of the Anti-Corruption Division. Wow, it has a, it's a very long name. Um, she has led an inclusive process of development of a new indicator-based peer review methodology on the fifth round of monitoring of Istanbul Anti-Corruption Action Plan that was launched in 2023. She is now engaged in the development of the Phase 5 monitoring methodology for OECD Anti-Bribery Convention and Anti-Corruption Indicators for OECD Member States. Prior to joining OECD, this is when I knew her, uh, in 2006-2014, uh, Rusudan mm, has led various anti-corruption and criminal justice reform initiatives and projects in Georgia. She has served as a secretary of the Anti-Corruption Council, the chair of the Open Government, Government Georgia's Forum, secretary of Criminal Justice Reform Council, and the chair of the Juvenile Justice Working Group in Georgia. Uh, her experience includes work at the Crime and Justice Institute in Boston, um, U.S. Uh, next to Rusudan is, uh, the, uh, is our distinguished colleague from um, U.S. Embassy, uh, Sarah Rupert. Uh, she is the um, director of the International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs at the U.S. Embassy in Tbilisi. She manages 21 million multi-year foreign assistance funds and directs a 10-person office in implementing rule of law and law enforcement assistance programs here. Previously, Sarah served in Washington, D.C. Uh, as the economic unit chief in the office of the coordinator for Cuban affairs, where she served as a senior economic advisor on Cuba. She also served in the office of Central American affairs monitoring political and economic developments in the countries of Nicaragua, El Salvador, and Guatemala. Her overseas post postings included U.S. Embassy in Moscow, the American Institute in Taiwan, Taipei office, and the U.S. Embassy in Caracas. Prior to joining the Foreign Service, Sarah was a Peace Corps volunteer and a volunteer coordinator in Dominican Republic. Uh, Nicolas Ayosa, I hope I pronounced it correctly, Director of Transparency International um, EU. Nick has been the Transparency International, uh, in Transparency International EU for over nine years and is currently the Director, Head of Policy and Advocacy. Uh, apart from being responsible for the day-to-day -day management of the office, he oversees the entirety of the policy and advocacy work, having previously led the political integrity team as well. Nick uh, will lead TIEU through a crucial European elections while continuing to push for critical reforms to EU policy in the areas of political integrity, illicit financial flows, and the rule of law. We also have the head of Georgia TI with us, uh, Eka Gigauri, uh, who's been uh, with the TI Georgia since 2010, uh, if I'm not mistaken. 
Under her leadership, TI expanded its work tremendously, established five regional offices, started various new initiatives and successful projects. In November 2019, she was elected as a board member of the Transparency International Global Movement, uh, serving a three-year term and also became a member of the Government Partnership uh, Civil Society Steering Committee. Uh, ECA has an extensive experience in governments, non-governmental sector, uh, private sector, uh, with a focus on foreign relations, marketing and communications consultancy, and successful oversight of anti-corruption reforms during her tenure as a civil servant, uh, serving a deputy head of the Border Police of Georgia. Uh, and it is my particular pleasure to welcome uh, two of our Ukrainian colleagues, one of them actually being Georgian, but working for the Ukrainian government, uh, who, uh, who are together with us today. Um, and thank you for that. Thank you for finding time and coming to Tbilisi. Tatiana Khutor is the chairwoman of the Institute of Legislative Ideas in Ukraine, an independent Ukrainian think tank that provides anti-corruption and sanctions policy analysis. She is currently involved in the development of legislation on criminalization of sanction evasion and management of seized assets. She is the head of the Anti-Corruption Council of the National Agency of Ukraine for finding, tracing, and managing assets derived from corruption and other crimes. She is also a member of the Civil Council of the National Agency on Corruption Prevention of Ukraine. Tatiana Khutor is a senior lecturer on anti-corruption policy and assets recovery at the National University of uh, Kiev Moh Mohila Academy and is currently working on her PhD thesis focusing on anti-corruption issues as well. Uh, she also worked for the parliament <coughs> as the director of the Ukrainian Anti-Corruption Parliament Committee head in 2015-2018. Uh, last but not least is um, um, our um, um, Georgian-Ukrainian colleague, uh, Mr. Gizo Glava, first deputy head of the National Anti-Corruption Bureau of Ukraine. Uh, Mr. Mr. Oglava has 15 years of experience in Georgian prosecution authorities and has last position in Georgia. his last position in Georgia was a Deputy Prosecutor General. He is co-author of the Law on the NABU, a body uh, whose creation and subsequent work is considered the most successful anti-corruption reform in Ukraine. Uh, from the day the NABU was founded until now, uh, which is already ninth year, uh, he has been holding this position of the first deputy director. This is not all. Uh, the uh, experiences of my fellow panelists is much uh, richer. Uh, there is much more to read and you can, as Georgi said, um, go to the QR code and find more information about them. Uh, now, uh, as, uh, as we were tasked on this panel, uh, the um, Issue that issues that we want to uh, touch upon or discuss are related, obviously, to the uh, December de decision of the European Union and um, further enhancement of the uh, requirements for more anti-corruption reforms, more systematic approach to the to fighting uh, corruption uh, with strengthening institutions, um, with uh, passing particular legislation and uh, cooperation and maximum uh, participation of the whole society, including civil society uh, players and, uh, and general public, uh, um, particularly when it comes to public finances. Um, as, as the uh, main topic of our discussion is going to go around the European Union issues, um, I want to ask Nick to start our discussion and to tell us a little bit more as to the tools, instruments, procedures uh, European Union has in, on the, down this road and also what are the concrete issues that uh, 2024 European parliamentary elections are going to run on uh, when it comes to the anti-corruption um, issues. Thank you very much, uh, and, and indeed, it, it's it's quite a crucial moment, uh, not not only for here, but but uh, in the approach to uh, the European elections uh, in June. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, IDFI very much for uh, the kind invitation to speak here today. I'm I'm very pleased to be here, um, and I thought I would take the opportunity to sort of uh, uh, 
as a as a as an inhabitant of the Brussels bubble for for many years, not only uh, transnational national EU, but in the, in the European Parliament for for over six years, uh, give sort of a general impression of the framework uh, that the European Union has used to counter corruption over the last decade, uh, and particularly uh, where we're going from here and some of the opportunities uh, that that we will we will hopefully capture, but also some of the challenges that that we will ultimately face. Um, so I'll start off probably with just a, a little bit of a, a background on how the union has traditionally approached anti-corruption. And, and unfortunately, it has been, over the last several years, um, uh, not as cohesive as, as you'd think, uh, simply because uh, the union is bound by the competences of the treaties. Uh, and corruption isn't clearly defined as, as you'd like it to be. Uh, and so uh, the union has approached it through uh, different instruments traditionally, uh, mostly through um, UNCAC or UN instruments uh, and different framework agreements uh, that have uh, meant that uh, it has become a patchwork of legislation that has been developed over the years. Uh, and oftentimes it has taken a, a sectoral approach. Uh, it was mentioned earlier, uh, the public procurement directives is an example. Uh, it has looked at corruption through uh, financial crimes, with, through anti-money laundering or asset recovery. Uh, it has looked at it through the lens of, of protecting freedom of, of expression and those who report wrongdoing uh, with the passage of, say, the whistleblowing directive uh, in, in 2018, a, a piece of legislation that I spent five years of my life uh, trying, to, trying to get over the line. Um, and that has led to sort of a non-alignment uh, of a lot of the legislation. Um, with the exception of how the framing of anti-corruption uh, has taken place since, I would say, 2016 and 17. Uh, in 2016 and 17, the, the union, I think, uh, looked at what was happening in the 27, then 28, soon to be 27 member states, uh, and saw what unfortunately was becoming a, a rapid decline in some of the rule of law standards uh, in some of the member states. Uh, and they looked at the, the, the tools at their disposal, uh, to try and address these threats uh, to democracy, to the rule of law, and they realized that they didn't have the requisite tools. Uh, and again, oftentimes in Brussels, they like their toolboxes, they like to put a lot of tools in them, uh, but in, in, in this case, they were, they were deficient. Uh, and so they, they went about to try and develop an, an entire new framework on, on the rule of law, uh, and they did this through a, a number of ways. Uh, first, they just developed a, a four-pillar methodology of what they considered rule of law, which was actually quite, quite a process for them. Uh, and it, it ended up with four pillars. One, uh, independent judiciary, uh, checks and balances, media pluralism, and a proper anti-corruption frameworks. And then they used the, that, that methodology to develop, I would say, uh, several tools, both from a preventative side of things and a punitive side of things. And so what they did in the first instance was they brought forward a... Uh, an annual assessment of rule of law in the 27 member states based on this methodology. Uh, this was an annual assessment that, that we at TI had been calling for for many years. Uh, the commission had carried out uh, an anti-corruption report in 2014, uh, and uh, apparently it was perhaps too candid for the member states. And so uh, in the face of uh, immense pressure and opposition from national capitals, they abandoned it. Uh, and now they brought it back after many years. And it's a crucial tool in trying to understand uh, horizontally what are some of the main threats to the rule of law in the member states. And now, uh, just recently in the last year, uh, they have included uh, country-specific recommendations. Uh, I mean, are they robust enough? Are they strong enough? Are they detailed enough? Is there requisite follow-up? No, but it's a work in progress. Uh, the second uh, tool that they used was punitive. Um, well, the commission would call it uh, preventative, and I, I would suppose I agree with that right up until the point where they trigger it and then it becomes punitive. Uh, and that is the rule of law conditionality regulation. Uh, and that is uh, an instrument that uh, looks at the rule of law in the member states and, if necessary, uh, suspends funding, EU funding from that member state until corrective measures are put into place. Uh, this is also a piece of legislation that we worked on in the office for many years. Uh, I actually didn't think it was going to get ultimately adopted because of the opposition, uh, because member states don't like punitive instruments when it comes to other member states. I mean, Article 7, if you know, is, a, is, is an article that suspends voting rights in the council. I would argue that it is ripe for, for, for use over the many years, and it has not been used because of the controversy of sanctioning peers. Um, but it was adopted, uh, and, and even more, uh, surprising, at least again to me, perhaps being uh, slightly jaded, having worked around politicians in Brussels for too long, 
and for them, uh, is that it, it was triggered, and it was triggered against Hungary uh, for essentially not having the requisite anti-corruption frameworks in place, and also issues of, of independent judiciary. Um, and that, is, that has been quite a, quite a, quite a moment in Brussels. Uh, I, I know that it, it has it recently experienced some problems with the, with the release of funds attached to other instruments, uh, but these tools, I think, have, have been quite, quite instrumental in the EU's response and continued response, hopefully, uh, to some of the, some of the anti-corruption uh, issues in, in, in the member states. What's changed now, and now we'll take a look forward, is, is that I think that the, the Commission uh, realizes it has the, the tools in place in many regards to tackle corruption, but they don't have the framework. Uh, one of the biggest, I would argue, deficiencies of how the EU approached anti-corruption is the lack of a strategy. They have an anti-fraud strategy, uh, but they never had an anti-corruption strategy, something we also called for. And so recently, uh, in a, a rather impressive political commitment by the president of the commission, they came forward with an anti-corruption package uh, last year. Uh, the package contains three instruments, um, two, two non-legislative, or two legislative and one non-legislative. It comes forward with a, a legislation on, on a sanctions regime, uh, which is an external in nature. It has uh, a communication, which is uh, non-legislative, but it, it's puts together a framework uh, that, that could be really utilized uh, to address some of the issues that we see in, in the member states. Uh, one, it has a strategy. Um, two, it creates a, a network of anti-corruption experts. Uh, and this expert group is meant to convene and really delve into uh, the risk areas that we see uh, taking place uh, in, the, in the member states. Uh, and, then, and then the third, um, commitment is to increase cooperation with civil society organizations. Uh, and this is, this is going to be quite crucial, uh, particularly going forward with some of the political dynamics that we see uh, in Brussels. Um, it has a directive, it's just the legislative instrument, which uh, meant, is meant to harmonize a, a lot of the existing rules, but also to, to increase the, the criminal uh, uh, laws that, that uh, are, are uh, related to uh, corruption offenses, which didn't exist horizontally across 27 member states. It has a particular focus on preventative measures, uh, which I think is quite crucial. And so it will look to try and harmonize and increase laws when it comes to transparency of, 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 of public officials, disclosures, conflicts of interest, lobby transparency, uh, and, and, other, and other preventative measures. And it will also, uh, again, uh, try to tackle what is oftentimes the, the stumbling block on getting uh, justice, if you will, is enforcement. And making sure that requisite resources in place, uh, information exchanges are there, and the judiciary is there to, to properly uh, address these cases of corruption and, and, and bring, them, bring them to justice. Uh, and then very briefly, because I, I know I'm, I'm, I'm short on time now, but um, uh, challenges. Um, uh, challenges. Uh, there are a couple coming, coming down the track, and um, uh, one, of course, is that, um, and I'll, I'll start with probably the biggest one, uh, I'm not a civil servant, um, <laughs> but, but I recognize uh, the instrumental process of once the political uh, decision has been made, for instance, say, in a candidate status, that in many regards, yes, it turns into a technical exercise and something that obviously civil servants will work for, towards, civil society will, will be engaged in. Uh, and, off, and, and that is my role, too, in, in, in Brussels, is to make sure that, you know, the technical exercise is completed properly and efficiently. Uh, but that's only one element. Uh, the other element is to make sure that the, the, the requisite political will remains so that technical exercise can be carried out properly and, and at the pace that it should be. And that is sometimes uh, lacking, particularly in cases uh, with, with enlargement processes. Uh, and will be crucial, uh, and again, and I, I'll touch on on it in a second when it comes to uh, the change of leadership uh, in Brussels, which will happen, which will happen in, 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 in this year, in June, uh, in the European uh, Parliament, and later in the year with the constitution of, of the new College of Commissioners. Um, there's also some other challenges that I'll briefly mention before I just touch on the elections. And one is, is the member states have always had a problem with, with transposition. Um, we might have a, a series now of, of good legislation in place to tackle corruption, uh, but once it's handed over to the member states, uh, we always find that uh, the transposition and impl implementation of that is lacking. And the whistleblowing directive is a, is a prime example. Uh, member states had two years to transpose a whistleblowing directive, and, and they ultimately uh, chose not to. And so when the date came, 
to, 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 to the commission to assess. Uh, 26 of 27 member states had not adopted any laws to protect whistleblowers. Um, uh, now, I commend the commission because they didn't uh, immediately enter into infringement procedures, which is essentially a punitive process to compel them to, to, to transpose it. But it speaks to the, the, the lack of seriousness sometimes member states uh, take when it comes to implementing anti-corruption laws. Um, and then, of course, it does come to the year elections, and this will be crucial. Um, it will be crucial because it will be a change in leadership, but it will also mean, I, I would say, a, a possible recomposition of the political landscape. Uh, a, a political landscape that I, I fear will be populated uh, with a little bit more uh, parties from the far right uh, that will hamper and hinder uh, anti-corruption efforts in the union, uh, but also in their relations uh, with candidate countries. Um, but perhaps, of course, that's why we're here. Uh, to work towards making sure uh, that the progress continues uh, both in the member states but but also here uh, in, in Georgia. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for this very informative um, start of, of our discussion. Now I want to turn to Rusudan, uh, representing OECD, and to see how it, how those commitments or recommendations um, made in um, First in 12 point, now in nine point plan by the European Union towards the enlargement countries. Look from the OECD perspective, what are the main, um, uh, main issues that, um, that both organizations will be trying at least to, to have uh, enforced and implemented in Georgia, Moldova, Ukraine, as well as in Balkan uh, countries and all, the, all, the, uh, all across the board. Thank you very much, Tina Tin. Thank you to IDFI and organizers. Uh, it's, I'm delighted to be here today uh, to do, speak with the Georgian and international audience back uh, home after so many years. Um, answering to your question, Tina Tin, um, uh, what does it take to have a holistic approach to fighting corruption? Um, we know there have been different institutions, international, on an international plane, that deal with these issues. So that have looked into the areas and international instruments that exist, they provide that holistic approach means, first of all, sound anti-corruption policies coupled with prevention of corruption and enforcement uh, um, of uh, corruption offenses uh, by strong institutions that are independent, uh, that deliver with transparency and accountability and with the engagement of citizens and civil society. So there's quite a lot to unpack here and we will not have time to dwell into all of it but maybe ha let's look at some of the key um, uh, key areas that uh, the European Commission has looked throughout enlargement countries and that have been recurring um, and that are also fundamentals of EU accession process and uh, we could look at anti-corruption policy for example asset declarations and uh, a credible track record of enforcement of corruption offenses that is one of the key requirements of EU conditions uh, for, to the enlargement countries. Let's have a look at what happened uh, in the last year as um, uh, reflected in the EU Commission uh, communication as well as the enlargement report, uh, reports of all the enlargement countries. That's also reflected in the OECD relevant work of the anti-corruption network uh, and its fifth round of um, monitoring methodology, the peer review coupled with the indicators uh, to monitor progress. Well, first of all, the latest OECD reports um, for some of the Eastern Partnership countries show that um, there are significant progresses. There's significant progress in these countries in terms of developing sound anti-corruption policies that are um, Inclusive, inclusive uh, that are based on evidence, and uh, there is also some structures put in place to coordinate their implementation. On anti-corruption policies, what is lacking, uh, though, is necessary resources, budget uh, uh, for implementation, but also tracking of uh, the progress uh, against uh, impact indicators and looking at um, replicating what has worked um, in in. Uh, the next policy cycles. The European uh, Commission has 
urged um, uh, enlargement countries such as Georgia, uh, Moldova, uh, I think Albania and Serbia as well to have such uh, anti-corruption strategies adopted soon in order to have a smaller gap uh, between the strategic frameworks. Um, and we know that one, if the anti-corruption policies are um, used as efficient tools, uh, they can actually engage citizens and they can raise uh, awareness as well as uh, help the authorities uh, plan successfully and implement successful anti-corruption reforms. The second area uh, that we could talk a bit about to set the stage and then I'm looking forward to insightful exchanges is the uh, powerful tool uh, that is anti-corruption prevention mechanism uh, but also used for detection uh, of corruption and um, follow-up uh, in investigations. That's asset declarations. And uh, the EU uh, Commission recommendations has fo have, have focused on verification functions of the relevant bodies and that even though the asset declarations framework exists in most of these countries, the lack of verification and follow-up is one of the issues that has been consistently highlighted. Um, uh, and uh, knowing the example of, for example, Ukraine, we know that asset declarations is one of the tools uh, that works and uh, that gets a lot of pushback as well in the countries uh, but, um, w once it starts becoming operational. And uh, in case of Ukraine, there were a lot of uh, battles around this instrument, uh, first uh, instituted in it and then um, uh, trying to abolish it through constitutional court decisions, etc., and then the bringing it back. Uh, during the war, it has been put on pause, but um, uh, luckily Ukraine reintroduced it and it also promises to have uh, you know, wide access to asset declarations. It's important to have a broad scope of um, the disclosure uh, and the European Union has commanded Georgia uh, uh, to extend the uh, scope of the uh, disclosure as well as the uh, declarants um, extending as the declarations to prosecutors in line with Greco recommendation. Uh, it is also important to ensure the public access to, uh, to asset declarations uh, um, with the limited restrictions that are necessary for uh, privacy and that are justified according to the legislation. Uh, the next point is, uh, then the last point that is also linked to independent institutions is the track record of uh, credible investigations and prosecutions of corruption with final convictions. Uh, with a particular focus of high-level corruption, on high-level corruption. And that has been also featured in almost all enlargement um, recommendations and the reports. Um, the practitioners uh, in this room, uh, looking on my left side, uh, know how difficult it is to detect uh, and investigate and prosecute high-level corruption. It takes uh, strong institutions that are independent, um, that have adequate powers and resources, but it also takes uh, a lot of mobilization, uh, so to say, in the society to protect this institution sometimes, again, as uh, the case of Ukraine has shown. Um, the stronger these institutions get, the stronger there is a pushback and uh, there is um, uh, the attempts to undermine their independence um, uh, through, for example, and we know the independence guarantees lie into the appointment and dismissal procedures, um, as well as uh, um, the independence and um, Im not immunity, but pr prevention of interferences into their activities. So these are the core independence guarantees. And uh, the stronger they get, the bigger there is um, uh, there is um, uh, the interest to influence them. Uh, um, and uh, in this case, uh, we all know, uh, it's also expressed in the latest um, reports of the OECD, but also uh, Venice Commission conclusion on uh, Georgia's Anti-Corruption Bureau, um, uh, which also outlines the existing practices uh, of uh, institutions. Uh, it's not... Uh, 
uh, about the model that a country I is using, but uh, about the independence guarantees, accountability and transparency, but also powers and resources and specialization of these institutions that brings track record. In terms of the track record of high-level corruption, the Commission has said that it remains insufficient and high-level corruption remains widespread in the region. Uh, one of the indicators of uh, Istanbul Anti-Corruption Action Plan monitoring is um, that all allegations of high-level corruption that were brought into the uh, public authorities need to be investigated and prosecuted. And if not, then the explanation has to be provided to the public why these cases have not been investigated. So this is one of the strongest indicators that we have um, in the anti-corruption um, network Istanbul Action Plan monitoring. Mm, so on, on this one, I think the highlight of uh, the recent anti-corruption eff efforts, we have to say, has been Ukraine, which set up institutional structures to fight corruption. And despite Russia's unjustified uh, war of aggression against Ukraine, and the Ukrainian authorities uh, have shown remarkable resilience and uh, increase in the enforcement rate of uh, cases uh, against high-level and co complex corruption. And uh, I'm happy that we'll be hearing about this uh, today. Um, OECD is really proud to have contributed to this reform. Uh, uh, back in 2006, there was the first recommendation of the Istanbul Action Plan to set up such an institution. And we see that it operates now in cooperation with the um, uh, SAPO, which is a specialized institution for prosecution and high anti-corruption court. Um, and uh, the trend has also been uh, to set up such institutions um, throughout other enlargement countries. For example, now uh, in case of Moldova, there is a conversation ongoing on um, setting up anti-corruption uh, court. Uh, there are obviously investigative structures uh, that operate uh, with uh, relative success uh, in, the, in uh, fighting uh, corruption, such as in case of uh, specialized anti-corruption office uh, of prosecutorial and uh, investigation offices in Albania, etc. Uh, and one of the prominent examples of already European Union member countries is uh, Romania that deals with high-level corruption with with success, uh, it's a national um, directorate uh, on anti-corruption. Um, and finally, uh, touching upon uh, the institutions, uh, although the independence of judiciary is not part of the anti-corruption cluster uh, in the European Union recommendations, it's a separate cluster. We at the OECD Anti-Corruption Network deal with the independence of judiciary under anti-corruption. Um, and uh, the key components that we look at when we monitor compliance with international standards is the appointment and promotion of judges, uh, judicial governance bodies, uh, budget um, and autonomy, uh, budgetary autonomy of the judiciary and accountability of judges and disciplinary proceedings. And these, of course, uh, have also been uh, featured in the enlargement reports Basically, IAP recommendations and instruments are aligned with the, the EU uh, enlargement recommendations. And on judiciary, this has been a challenging area for all en enlargement countries, but we have seen some new emerging trends of, for example, integrity vetting and setting up judicial governance bodies through participation of international experts with a decisive role. Um, this has been an emerging good practice uh, that is being promoted. Um, uh, European Union, for example, commended uh, Moldova on um, uh, pre-vetting uh, for the Supreme Judicial Magistr Magistrate Council. Um, and uh, here again, the most recent uh, example is of Ukraine, where uh, judicial reform had been in a deadlock until Ukraine decided to go for reforming judicial governance bodies uh, through the participation of international experts. And uh, obviously it's not in the judicial, judiciary system uh, reform uh, as a whole, but high anti-corruption co court that stands uh, out um, uh, has paved the way through to uh, 
larger uh, reform in this area. Uh, so this is initial remarks and I'm happy to have a follow up. Thank you, Rusudan. Um, I think we will come back to most of the issues that uh, you have mentioned, particularly when it comes to actual implementation of those uh, those tools and uh, actual installment of those tools into domestic legislation and domestic institutional systems, being it accountability for the asset declarations. One thing is to have it, and it's very good that uh, countries are expanding this cup of the public officials who are required to file asset declarations. but. Uh, uh, not to have it, uh, uh, kind of formalistic, tick the box kind of a, a instrument, but a real active, live, effective tool for anti-corruption work. We do need to install all those and use all those recommendations and install all those uh, tools and mechanisms developed by OECD or under the frameworks of the European Union or bilaterally uh, by our strategic partners for uh, having actually good use from those as, as a declarations and fighting corruption and actually having a pur purpose to to all of this and same goes for obviously for this absolutely wonderful provision of the Istanbul Action Plan, which at, as you've already uh, mentioned talks about compulsory investigation of all publicly known corruption claims, which again serves the purpose of accountability and bigger goal of transparency and uh, keeping governments in line with uh, with the um, honest and uh, transparent civil service. And uh, I believe that none of those uh, um, recommendations or policies can be implemented uh, separately, like Georgia or any other country for that matter cannot go just okay, European Union asks for this and let's do this and forget the everything else. It's all, yes, the holistic approach is extremely important. It goes deeply into the bilateral relationships as well. And the US being the champion in most of this anti-corruption fight obviously plays, particularly in this country, significant role in, in, compliance, in, in compliance mechanisms and effective systems. So Sarah, uh, tell us more about the uh, global fight against corruption that the uh, U.S. is championing so much for, for this de decade, at least. Well, thank you very much, Tina Teen, for moderating. Um, I'm honored to be included alongside these experts. Thank you to Georgi and the team at IDFI for hosting this really useful forum today. Um, I, don't think, I don't think we can say that you, the U.S. is a champion. I think every country around the world struggles with corruption. Um, and so I think that's why it's important to continue discussions on what more can be done. Um, as as uh, Tina Teen mentioned, uh, I'm the INL director. Um, the title of Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs is a little misleading. Um, here in Georgia, we work on, on issues across the justice sector, institutional uh, capacity building as well as individual capacity building. And this includes efforts uh, to combat corruption. Um, here in Georgia, in particular, we work closely with the two investigative bodies, the Prosecution Service, and within the State Security Service, the Anti-Corruption Agency, to try to build the capacity to investigate and prosecute corruption. Um, one thing that we've pointed them to lately is the International Anti-Corruption uh, Coordination Center in London, um, which is, I think, a really great institution for um, investigative bodies to seek out additional information, particularly when corruption crosses borders. Um, and uh, now we are um, excited to work closely with the newly created Anti-Corruption Bureau in Georgia um, as they uh, start to address the anti-corruption uh, recommendations laid out in the, in the EU candidacy nine steps. Um, I, I wanted to mention, you know, recently we had uh, our global uh, coordinator on anti-corruption, Richard Nephew, visiting the country, as many of you may know. Um, while he was here, he met with civil society, businesses, government entities. Um, he met with this diverse group of actors because we, we believe it's important that there be multi-stakeholder engagement, um, and that's the key to combating corruption, um, which is why events like this today are, are so important. Um, and Richard's position was actually newly created um, to better coordinate the United States global efforts to counter corruption um, and response, in response to President Biden's elevation of this fight against corruption 
as a really a core national security interest. Um, we see the consequences of corruption, um, you know, resulting in weakened states that can be make those states therefore vulnerable. Um, and you know, the international community becomes weaker, sicker, more exposed, and so in that context, no state is really safe. Um, you know, ju just like uh, I mentioned earlier, the United States has not figured out <laughs> combating corruption. Nobody, nobody has. Um, and so I think it's just really important that nobody rests on its laurels. Um, you know, many countries have made progress in some areas more than others, uh, better procurement systems, uh, legislation that protects whistleblowers, stronger judicial systems, information sharing uh, for the gathering of evidence, but n no country really is immune. Um, and this, this idea of strategic corruption has also really started to, to come to light. And I think it's important to talk about, um, you know, that th this idea that uh, a, an actor could use um, the a country, uh, you know, use corruption to uh, engage in illicit trade and, and therefore threaten, threaten each state. Um, and I think, you know, everybody in this room knows that we're not going to be able to end corruption. Um, we can make it harder and harder to get away with. Um, and so I think it's important to talk about the tools that we have. Um, you know, uh, Nicholas mentioned uh, already the UN Convention Against Corruption, um, one of the most universal conventions now with 190 member states. Um, the United States recently hosted the Conference of State Parties in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, we gathered not only um, government actors, but also civil society and activists and champions. I was pleased that Tina Teen, uh, Georgi, and, and some of ECA's colleagues were able to attend. Um, you know, there's also an increasing focus on the role that private sector um, can play in combating corruption. Um, and I, I think it's true that more recently, the private sector has really been seized with upholding this responsibility that they have to foster a global business environment um, that's hostile to these corrupt actors. And so in the United States, we've, we've tried to look for ways to strengthen our incentive structures um, to combat corruption. Um, I just wanted to mention a few of the recent um, actions we've taken. Uh, over the last month, the president um, issued a proclamation that strengthens our ability to deny access to the United States of those who enable significant public corruption in other countries. Um, Congress, too, has passed several laws uh, augmenting the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act um, with a Foreign Extortion Prevention Act. And uh, there's a brand new act called Combating Global Correction Act um, that Congress recently passed that will strengthen the State Department's ability to acknowledge the hard work of our foreign uh, partners in addressing corruption. Um, so these are all these are all good steps, um, all tools in our tool belt, um, and uh, I know uh, m everybody on this panel and, and most in the room um, are working tirelessly um, to fight corruption. And I think most important is is the international collaboration and cooperation, the partnerships we have. Um, so I'm I'm excited to hear more today about the sorts of good governance initiatives around the region and how, how Georgia can be a part of that. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. Um, yeah, exactly. Moving to those good practices from the region, from the countries that we are actually talking about uh, for this uh, half an hour. Uh, Ukraine. Um, um, well, first, uh, let's start with your Gizo. Uh, if you, we, we talk so much about Dinabu, but uh, can you um, can you tell us more about it? What it is all about? How, how successful it is? Why it is so successful? What happened with the political will in a country that is fighting uh, fighting this uh, cruel war uh, initiated by Russia uh, still uh, has an appetite to implement all those recommendations to to go. Uh, along the anti-corruption measures and have uh, as much success shown as possible. And please, I think Gizo is going to talk in Georgian, so um, uh, get the uh, headphones uh, for this particular presentation. Didi Madluba, I hope you all are the Didi Madluba organizer of the Chamber of Choice, and 
نندروی در گوشه بشانس روم شغلی اوره نزمی مرتضو سازگار دوید. سانم کنکرتو پاسخ خب سکاب صدی تو کنسکی تو خب سم مکرت موقعی را ایس اوکراین سنتیونالی آنتی کاربرسیولی بیورو دار و گلاری سات قبیلی آنتی کاربرسیولی امپراتوری اوکراین است. آنتی کاربرسیولی بیورو رو من سات سامش مکبر بود خدا نبود سه دقیقه سه سالی سامرتالام تابی ارگانو داموی که دبل سامرتالام تابی ارگانو رو من سامو تان بیا خیلی سوپرایز مقاله شون نبشه کاربرسی است نبود زود. چون ویژه به تاک می‌بیس، مینیستر بیس، دپوتات بیس، مسامرت بیس، مقاله رنگیس، پروکورور بیس، سنترالوری داد، گلوبلی مارتفلو بیس، اخماسرو بیل خیلی سوپل بیس، زارماد گنل بیس می‌مارد. مگر ما، آنتی کورپسولی بیورو، آرایش خود ده تا ده تیشماد گنل ناتیلی، من آنتی کورپسولی امپراتوریس رو می‌لیت سوپراین نشیا. آرسیبوس، آنتی کورپسولی پروکوراتورا رو می‌لیت. پرمال رو چه ماده گنل ناتیلی یا گنرال پروکوراتوریس مگر ما گاهی نه زالیان دیدی اینستیتیونال داموکی دبلا بدا. ارسیبوس ابسلوت رو اتامو که دوباره انتی کورپسیولی سازمان می‌کند. سوالی دیگه سام کوتاه دیگه از لوبس هش ولی باشند بولند شه وینار چوند. اتامو که دوباره بوده، پاکت رو ات سخت است کانون لوباشی، افکت رو ات به بزولت کورپسی است. از سخت لیار کپیلا تالیان مارتی. نابوم اسبی انتی کورپسیولی پروکوراتورم تالیان بهبودی پلیتیکوریزت ولی کدایی تنها کدایی تنها مگرام. حالا از پلیتیکو ریزت حالا ابسلت را تر ماته بیتی کنند. تا از دوولی ده سر کپلام خواهد دام ساکوره با تانم شون لوئیس رومینزیک مشاور. این مدارم چون از مشاور باشی در لیام پارتو داریش چرتولی سازوگادوی با چه تانر سبب سازوگادوی برای کنترلی سابچو. رومینز خواهد لورت از ازی چه با اینترنت خمیس می تمید. تا از لیام دیالیس پارتنر بی چرتولو با چون ساک میان. شکل فام آمان کلا پرما کمپلکس رات بخش از سرشو لبرم. تا گذشته از پریمیم بیدا که گذشته بی نگزا. شاید سوپ رو بین سیستم و کروپسیا ز دا میپیکر پرو سیستم و کروپسیا او که اگر ریس ارثی که اکنون پریمیم هم راول جراغی نیست نه میتونم. سابن کو سیستم است که کمیکاتی سرشوری بیست کارم تاره بیست پیرو بیشه کروپسیا هم شاید زینا پاکتوره ترانسکشنالی نیست نو با. میشه میذاره رامودنی به دانش آوری مگه که ترامپ چون سمیلی کنن گاز نمیاد ناتلات میوتی تبصیم از روم پاکتورات کروپسی او که اتیکو اکنون سپارک دوبشه آگاری که تپا. سه تا شوست رزونانسی کام اویت و مقالتات چون کازابولز چتاره بول ما اپراتیم را درست زالیان دیو دنو بیست تامی ساقه بیست پاکسه دکاوی بولی کنن از نهایت سازمان توست اوج دومار. اولیگارکی چون بله اولیگارکی اوکراینیلی روملیت تاوسا پاره بود ارتباط با اروپا که کنن کمیکاتی بسیار لوب تازه می‌بود دم ملا پاره که باست آره ارتباط سبانکو سیستمیست داشت شما ملا بیش می‌شود بیتی کنن گذاشت سمولی از کتام. از سوی زالین سایتری سویکو سیسکل سامارت ساکم روملیت سه بودا اینفراستراکتوریز مینیستریس موادگیلس دا ساکن که بندگو مرا به سیتیاتیس مقالت چین نوست می‌شود. کریپتو والیو تارا لیگالوری سبانکو سیستم بیسکام و کنن بیت فاکتورات کادات سمولیک نه یکی میلیون دلاری آرا اوکراینش سازگارگرده. تا قاضر تولیس خورم مولا پرکه بیدن، ارتن مکسیم ورساچی، اروپیس نبیس میرکو کنشی خدا بوده کشت پولیس کادات سه. تا خودت سایر تشویش رو تانم شون لو بیس پارک بپشم خودت سایر تشویش رو تانم شون لوی چون شد زلیت ارتی دم میوره شم تو بیس. تا پیکسی رو بذارم. سامیتام زالیم نیست نیلو وانیا. سه تا شوید سو تانم شون و دک بلش چرت ولو با آما سیستم آشی. میترسم که ترس کنه بذی تو اراس سیستم ور کروپسی است. میو پاس خورم. چون بذی تو ارگانیزه بول دانه شاول است رو میل سیستم ور کروپسی شم ات گنی ناتیلی. سیستم ور کروپسی است. نبود زوله شاول زله بلیا خلوت. سامارت دام سوی ارگانو بیست خریدن. آمیستی ساوت سیله بلیا. رپورت میبی. تا اوت سیله بلیا استوری سکادرو پلیتیکا. صحت لیس پرکتیک از گامو باشی نبود کنده آره ارتشیم تو آر دوست ارتشی دایگی و کابین نیچی کار که اولی پریودی شد دکتر اون دکی پاتیم رفیع دامیان اس خو پروکوراتوری سیستم آشی اس خو سعادت سخت دو سیستم آشی اس خو کنه بیس مارتی سعی کن توشی پس خوزگ باشی می‌بینید مایخس نه سه سامارتوی سالی مارتا ساکه ارتشی لیشم دکی ما و کابین نیچی آخال دانیش نولی دامیان اس خو باتر بی تو پریاتی اس و کابی دی تک زل دبود اس راز می‌و رام دنیت آرندا ایموش او سامرت دادم تو اورگانو اما تو پارالل تار تار دیبا رپورت می‌بی تا آرمین دیناله از صوری سکار در پلیتیکا سامرت دادم تو اورگانو بیس میشه و باشه دیگر سرگرم می‌شیم. خواهد از نشون لوانی اوکراین شد غصه از خدا با. تا خواهد از فلسا چینو. البته از اوکراین استیسات سالیان استیمگالیتیه دا اصلا تو کافشی سیت سیت. 
Սախյունցիպո մոխելևի, իծխեբ են անտիկորվությում որգանույության տանավշոն մաս։ Երդեր տիսավուկետիսումագալությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությությու կարկորի կրթամիս, շետավազեպիս, կրիպտովալիութիս, ուզրավի կոնեպիս, խադասվա շեղավատեպիս, շետավազեպիս, մի էր ոտ մինիսի ինվրասուկուրիս ամինիստով դան միծա, թանխեպի, պրոյեկտեպի, գայմարջովինա� նաբուշի, դա չվենց մի են խիլեվ ու լիկնա դանաշավուշի, էրդերտի ծնովիլի բիզնեսմենի ձալի են դիդի պոլիտիկուրի կավշիրը։ Ուկրայինեսի միմ դինարը ուս հարամ խոլոդ ուրեպորմ են բիարամը դիծուլբա, մին դինարյով դա կեվիս դա բումբա, իկոմ ծտելովա կեվի դա է բումբա։ Եուխադատ իմինսա վեխանաշի արիս ծալցախա ստրադեկիը, էպ զոլոն կորուպցի, ստա խոլազ դետ դիշե դեկ իրած մեվ թվլիրու ամբոլոց լ ոմիսա ապսորդուրատ գամջերով ալեց, այդաշորիսո պարտնյոր էվիս չարտուլովիտ, Սամոկալոքո սեկտորի չարտուլովիտ, արջավուլի իկնա անտիկորովցույուլի բիուրոս դիրեկտորի, արջավուլի իկնա անտիկորովցույուլի Սալիան դիդիամոցանա դեկլարացիևիս աղդգենա։ Մե մինդա գավախարորը դեկլարացիևը ու աղդգենի լիա։ Մե թիտոն չավոբարի ոզդերտի ոզդավորից լիս դեկլարացիևը ռոմից ոմիս գամոշեց խոտելի խոտա ո իրադատ այս դեկլարացիևի, գադա ամոտվան մուխել է թա կոնեբրիվիմ դգոմարևուբա, իմ տորով ռոգորի ձլիերի ծարունդայի խոսամարդալցոյի որգանոյի անպրևենցի իսակ, են տոյս վերշեց ձլեպս, խբերլա դեկլարացիևի շեմ ժլովանի։ Կարդա ամիսա ուգրայինը շի ծարմատեպիտ կանխործի էլ դեղլ ումաղը սիսա կոլիպկացիոս սապջոս արջևնեպի, ռոմելից մոսամարդլ տա պակտի ուրատ։ Կատա պասեպաս իծղեպս տա ձալիան ծարմատեպիտ մուշ բոլո կամուկիտ խոշի ուգրայինամ խոլոտ որիատաս ուզտա սամից լիստույս մի իղո սամի կուլա դա մի ուղխետավոտ ոմիսա ծայիցիացի։ Մատողթ։ Դիդի Մատլովակ, Thank you very much for this presentation, for concrete cases, for telling us the details of the work and I absolutely agree that there is no fight against systematic corruption without political will and without the participation of the, not only um, the entire um, political spectrum, but also the civil society and public at large. Uh, this is the only effective uh, way to, to combat the, not only the concrete corrupt ca corruption cases, but also to combat the attitudes and understanding of what is right and what is wrong, what is allowed in an honest, transparent uh, civil, civil service and what is not. And unfortunately, in our countries, that understanding is still missing to, to a certain degree. 
Um, but um, Tatiana, can you tell us from the other side of the table how this anti-corruption fight looks in Ukraine? How do you monitor how much you are you have an access? How much you you can actually track all the uh, activities that Isa was just describing? And also, we know from various reports published by European Union or OECD regarding the Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Tina Tin. Thank you for uh, having me here. Thank you for bringing me here and thank you for the opportunity to speak about Ukraine, to share our experience. And um, I do believe that it may be useful for Georgia. Why? Because yesterday uh, I just uh, found out that uh, our capitals were established uh, in the same time. So, and not only this, we have many like in common in our history. So. Unfortunately, uh, both good and bad things. So my presentation will be focused on the not only your integration, but the corruption, your integration, and the war, and how these three things are interlinked. Um, interlinked. So not only in time, but in senses. So for Ukraine, the year integration way is a bloody way. Um, I just recall some uh, historic. Oh, I have. I have this. Um, so I just want to recall some historic, um, uh, chron uh, some chronology on the Euro integration and the war. So we have 2013 and 2022. In 2013, uh, our totally corrupt regime, Yanukovych regime, uh, was uh, um, in fact. Um, Yanukovych, our like president, ex-president, he was uh, he flew to Russia right after the revolution of dignity. Right after he refused to sign the European uh, Association Agreement. So three things is uh, in common. Why? Because in a few months Russia invaded Ukraine, so invaded the east of Ukraine and the and Crimea. So three things interlink. In 2024, uh, 22. Russia uh, invaded, uh, like invaded, fully invaded Ukraine, and uh, in this year, Ukraine um, gained the status, the candidacy status, uh, for membership in the European Union. So um, we have like many things in common here. So at the moment, uh, there is like three, uh, like seven criteria set by uh, seven criteria set by European Commission for us. Um, and like we have obligations um, that five out of the seven criteria are, are connected to the anti-corruption. So now I'm going to talk about two perspectives. As you know, every reform, each reform needs like two contents, context. First is like real implementation, real actions, and the second is the communication of these uh, um, actions. So I think that it's like a half, a half of uh, uh, resources must be um, focused on the communication and the half of the resources for the implementation. Why? I think you know why, but Ukraine just felt it on uh, our own, uh, our, its own uh, skin. So, um, talking about the corruption in Ukraine, let's start from the perception of corruption. Um, as Gizo has mentioned, we have like uh, we have like uh, some um, success in it, but still, corruption greatly contributed to Russian-Ukrainian war. And why? First, Russia has spent much money on propaganda and disinformation about Ukraine inside the country and outside the country. If we're talking uh, inside the country, many Ukrainian politicians and top officials were corrupted by Russia and by Russian money. Many um, Ukrainian medias were funded by Russians, and after that we have much problems uh, due to these things, and due to the lack of resources Ukraine um, Ukraine um, gave to battle these things. And the second thing is international level. Russia really spent much money on the international propaganda and to make this, um, um, this image of Ukraine as a failed state. So what was the main reason and what was the aim of this, uh, of this action? In fact, um, our international partners, including, including EU, 
um, after all this information would turn must uh, they expected that would, uh, they will turn away from Ukraine like uh, and would not want to deal with us not EU not other countries so in fact the results were like tragic and even now talking with international media uh, about the confiscation of Russian assets and using it for Ukraine for compensation of damage caused by Russia the one of the first questions they are asking me oh Tatiana and won't this money be stolen in Ukraine so the situation is, is ridiculous and it's the m very important point you have to learn from our experience because we started to deal with it and um, it's in fact the result of dealing with this because uh, I don't know whether you can see it but still during the uh, during the war time the full-scale evasion time Ukraine's got three points um, in increment um, and get the best result in the world over past years and Ukraine become one of the 17 country in the year CPI that demonstrate its best results ever um, if we're talking about the um, national service the specialized anti-corruption agencies has increased significantly the um, the trust uh, the trust from Ukrainians during the uh, wartime and the largest increase in public trust occurred to the uh, National Security Service at 40% in 2023 compared to 12% in 2021 so what's the point here of course the wolf is not as scary as it is described especially by Russians and due to Russian money but it's still the wolf and we and Ukraine is uh, like trying hard to tame it and um, talking about the requirements anti-corruption requirements and um, it's not only like requirements starting from the very beginning of the war uh, of course the um, anti-corruption Oh, no, just I will just say a little bit more about uh, this these things. Um, according to national survey, almost 64 of Ukrainians believe that corruption could never be justified, and 84 percent of Ukrainians are ready to report cases of corruption. So, what is important to understand here? You cannot see it. The numbers, the main numbers, are below because this number were just doubled in half like from the very beginning of the invasion. So uh, why um, have these changes occurred? In fact, because of the corruption uh, during the war, the, and corruption during the war means that, for example, stolen $1,000 can, can cost the life of people, of one soldier, of two soldiers, of three soldiers. And due to the scale of this invasion, Every Ukrainian, almost every Ukrainian, has his loved one or a friend or uh, another or relative on the front. So the understanding of the corruption, of the meaning of the corruption, is really critical and crucial. So now the society understands, not only society, but everyone understands that the, uh, corruption is the second enemy after the Russia. And um, the government is well aware of this, and not the, only the government, the government understand uh, that civil society are ready and the society are, re are ready to protest if they reveal the facts of corruption and it's really important understanding for the government so let's move from the perception to reality to facts that um, shows how the um, not how Ukrainians not just feeling but what we see uh, since 2021, our think tank, ILI, started to monitor the Ukrainians' implementation, how Ukraine implement the international anti-corruption obligation, both national and international. And we started from the UNCAC, United Nations Convention Against Corruption. Why? Because, as have already been said, it's like universal thing. It's not uh, like rocket science or something like that. It's like working mechanism that uh, 
can be established and must be established as the basis for the uh, for the ensuring the normal life of people, for doing business, for a transparent public administration, procurement, and uh, etc. So, and um, we just uh, we did this um, uh, report, we did this assessment, we survived, and we interviewed over 100 experts, um, civil society experts, former officials, um, uh, over 100 of um, journalists, uh, anti-corruption journalists around Ukraine. So, and we got that report. But after that, the full evasion started, and many things uh, become really outdated. Why? Because uh, after the war broke out, the full-scale war broke out, um, most anti-corruption instruments were suspended. Register uh, registers were closed. The obligation to declare officials' assets were uh, stopped, and so did the verification of the declarations. Competitions for public office were cancelled. Open tenders uh, became, became optional, and etc. So, but, and we were really disappointed because we did a great job, to be honest. But in 2023, in Atlanta, we presented together with the Ukrainian government uh, another report based on the, what happened, based on the dynamics, what happened before, what happened during the war, and what happened like in 2023. And here you can see the, these dynamics. And it's worth noting that According to uh, this preliminary, uh, our preliminary assessment, assessment, 15 out of 16 articles were reviewed, had been fully implemented. Um, if we are talking about the legislation, and uh, main part of these uh, obligations were implemented um, on the uh, moderate level. If we're talking about implement implementation, of course, but um, you can see that many of these areas just uh, not and these indicators not only have uh, surpassed but not only just um, re um, um, just restored but it surpassed the pre-war uh, indicators and it's really important to understand and we are talking about the preventive anti-corruption policy practice about public procurement about the judiciary in fact and many other things so talking about the EU um, integration process. Uh, here we have another, uh, another story, but still it's a good story. So we estimated uh, how Ukraine fulfilled um, seven criteria. As I said, five of them are uh, connected to the anti-corruption. And um, according to the uh, Ukrainian civil society overview, um, Ukraine, uh, in fact, uh, has uh, like uh, the approximate estimate of compliance is eight out of ten, so it's really great. So in general, there is a possible uh, 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 there is a possible trends in the implementation of EU obligation and other anti-corruption obligations. Of course, the uh, we have to understand that our government, as any other government, are not eager to restore many anti-corruption instruments. Uh, and they want to have that discretion and they do not want to just like to uh, do whatever civil society and international partners are for, uh, want from them. But they understand that the issue of fighting corruption remains one of the main priorities in the society. And uh, what is and that's why they're moving forward with the anti-corruption um, reforms and efforts um, what lessons can be learned so of course i'm not encouraging you to uh do, to be involved in the war and to make the anti-corruption commitments like the uh priority because it's the matter of surveillance of course not but what i still can recommend you first of all first thing it's better to have less anti-corruption instruments but they must be working instruments this instrument must be implemented because we had that story when we have many anti-corruption instruments that they are not working they are just on the paper it sounds great but uh, in fact the life of civil society the life of country are not is not changed based of, of what is written on the paper so it's better to have less but working instruments. Second, 
anti-corruption institution must be independent. So you have to put as much resources as you can in the establishing really independent anti-corruption institutions. What is Ukrainian way is to is the contest. And the, uh, we put the international experts in within the uh, procedures um, in the uh, contact um, in the contents for the um, chiefs of the anti-corruption bodies. And now uh, we have like a very interesting situation because anti-corruption bodies are served not only uh, as like anti-corruption institutions but as sanction institutions because when on the beginning of the war uh, Ukraine established um, EU legislation and the confiscation like sanction confiscation of Russian assets of those who are involved in this aggression and when there were like a debates like closed debates uh, on uh, about which court must uh, hear these cases, they just sitting and said that we need the independent court. So, and one that we have is anti-corruption court. So now in Ukraine, anti-corruption court hear the cases on sanction confiscation. So um, we have to put resources in anti-corruption infrastructure because it may serve not only as like solely anti-corruption instruments. And third, um, we have to help those institutions who need this help. Uh, we have like a common problem that many government institutions are under-resourced and uh, only collective actions like civil society, think tanks, um, international expert and organization may must help these institutions, but only those institutions who really need this help, but not only talking about the need of, the need of this help. And the last maybe, but the most important thing that you can learn out of Ukrainian case, that anti-corruption, and Ukraine proved that anti-corruption is a matter of national security, uh, both internal and external. So start to put resources right now. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Tatiana. Thank you very much for this um, very, very insightful presentation and uh, extremely interesting as well. Eka, <laughs> it hurts my feelings to <laughs> to address you now um, with the uh, with this experience and with these stories from. Uh, from Ukraine, which we obviously know, uh, but are very strengthened by by the two presentations. Um, if you can give us like big picture of of the anti-corruption work movement uh, actions uh, in Georgia. Well, we all know Sarah mentioned it uh, that uh, Georgia has just established an anti-corruption commission, special tool instrument for fighting corruption, uh, as per European Union recommendation. What is the Georgian way of understanding the independence of the anti-corruption institutions uh, is clearly seen from, from that approach. And also, Rustan was talking about the concrete things like asset declarations, like uh, um, investigative mechanisms for publicly known corruption cases. We know we have hundreds and hundreds of stories developing in the country. Good news is that we've just heard from the head of newly created anti-corruption Institute that, or Commission that uh, they will review hundreds of uh, asset declarations, which never was the case before. Let's hope that uh, they actually take this job seriously and we will get some more information, more insight and actual real uh, check of the truth uh, declared there. But um, what's your perspective to, to where we are going to? <laughs> Okay, thank you, Tina. Thank you to IDFI for organizing this event and inviting me and for this opportunity. Uh, okay, so um, I think uh, Georgia is the unique example when it comes to the anti-corruption reforms, political will, holistic approach. Like, you know, we have all this here. I heard um, about the initiatives in Ukraine um, and um, the excitement of our colleagues about these initiatives. Uh, but I should say that we, some of the things existed in Georgia 15 years ago, right? So 
there was political will to fight corruption. There was political will to proactively uh, publish the um, information about the asset declarations, about the party funding, about the procurement. So all these platforms and all these initiatives were there. And definitely, I think uh, this is why at some point uh, people were calling Georgia as like, you know, front runner, like, you know, good example and all this. And I, we really were proud uh, about all these initiatives and all the achievements. And this is why at some point we had this huge jump in uh, corruption perception index. Um, definitely. Um, that was obvious that uh, we had unique anti-corruption reforms in Georgia. And there was a political will. But I think that uh, the problem with us was that there was no holistic approach, right? So because uh, our colleagues from, from Ukraine also talked about the institutional reforms, that all reforms should be there. And um, only reforming parts of the system uh, does not help. Um, and apparently when uh, you still have the problems uh, uh, with the independence of judiciary, for instance, um, does not matter. You might uh, have a good system of publishing information on asset declarations of public officials, but still if you don't have the independent justice system like the prosecutor's office or, or as I said, the judiciary, so it does not really help because we really need the involvement of those institution, institutions and we really need them to be effective. So, yeah, that is the example of Georgia. So we could not manage for so many years to uh, reform uh, the judiciary, reform the prosecutor's office, um, uh, make sure that uh, the civil society operates in the friendly environment, let's say, and the independent media as well. So, and uh, this is why apparently we can't move forward. Um, uh, this year we had three points less in corruption perception index. And if you look at the corruption perception index, you will see that it's not changing. Yes, there was something done, and then there was nothing done in order to fix the whole system to fix all the institutions uh, which play the crucial role in anti-corruption system. And uh, in TI, for instance, we have this um, uh, very interesting um, study which, which is called National Integrity System Assessment, where we look not only at the um, uh, anti-corruption agency and how it operates, but we look at 12 institutions like uh, uh, the uh, executive branch, like the, the parliament, like the uh, judiciary, prosecutor's office, media, civil society, like all these institutions should work properly in order uh, to have the proper anti-corruption system in the country. And unfortunately, even if the laws are there, we might not have the good practices and the implementation of the law, which is, which is problematic. Um, when, speak, uh, when talking about the, these nine steps and the conditions that uh, were emphasized by, by the EU Commission, um, I think that this is about the, uh, this is about the uh, effective anti-corruption reform. So, like everything that they are saying there, right? So, they say that we have to uh, fix the, uh, the problems in judiciary. Unfortunately, some of our judges are sanctioned by the US State Department for the involvement in corruption. And this is very problematic, I would say. And nothing was done in this, in this direction. Uh, then they speak about the, um, the, about the effective oversight functions of the parliament which is also very critical when it comes, when, when it comes to the effective anti-corruption system. Um, and here also special emphasis are made um, uh, on the oversight of the, um, um, uh, the uh, National uh, Security Agency, right? Which is the crucial agency inside of the system. 
Then they uh, talk about the appointment procedures of the uh, chief prosecutor, and apparently there are many questions about the independence of the prosecutor's office, and definitely if we manage to select through the um, transparent process and by the involvement of many um, groups in the parliament, including the opposition, uh, there might be less questions about the independence of this, uh, of this agency. Um, yes, there, are, mm, uh, there is the assessment and also particular uh, requirements towards the uh, anti-corruption agency. Um, I should say that for many years, uh, Transparency International Georgia was advocating for establishment of independent anti-corruption system, but here as well, it's important to ensure the independence of the anti-corruption system. And here also is important to look and review the um, appointment procedures of uh, the head of the anti-corruption agency. And again, our desire is for this agency to have uh, more powers, like investigative power, which will help. Um, um, and, um, um, and yes, so definitely um, uh, the EU talks about the um, involvement of the, um, of the um, uh, NGO community, the civil society in different uh, reform processes, which does not, does, does not, uh, did not happen at, at, uh, till this moment uh, in Georgia. So um, I don't know, let's hope that we will follow all the steps and recommendations. So the good thing is that uh, in the um, action plan of the government, for instance, when it comes to the anti-corruption um, agency, they say that they will implement everything that the Venice Commission is saying. And yeah, they promise this publicly and we hope that they will do this, right? So it, and it will help. Um, when it comes to the judiciary, I hope that one of the critical points there is um, uh, the vetting mechanism, right? So we had many years to fix uh, the problems in judiciary by ourselves, so it's good now that the kind of the recommendation is to create the group where there will be international experts and they will conduct the vetting together with Georgians and look at the uh, past experience uh, of the uh, members of the um, Supreme Court, members of the High Council of Justice, and uh, uh, some high officials in judiciary. I mean, it, it will be very important to, to implement this particular uh, recommendation because uh, it will actually help us to uh, make our judiciary more healthy, let's say, like to put it in an ethical way, <laughs> so because it's uh, it's really, really we think that judiciary is the the main the main institution in the whole um, anti-corruption system. One thing that I want to mention is the oligarchization, right? So this is also something new um, for us. Uh, how to deal with this? Uh, so uh, when first time. Um, Last year, in uh, 12 recommendations, uh, it was mentioned, the opinion of the uh, civil society was that we don't need to adopt the special law for this. If we ensure that the institutions are independent, you know, and if institutions act in accordance to the law, then there is no to adopt the particular legislation and to target uh, the particular individuals because like, you know, I mean, you can have the rich people in the country if they don't influence the institutions so what. So that's why um, uh, we are following uh, this uh, recommendation and this um, uh, kind of approach. Uh, we are uh, glad that the Venice Commission had the same approach that it's better to focus on the institutions rather than to adopt the law. And again, uh, I hope that, you know, at the end of this year, we will be in a good condition as a country, um, like, you know, delivering and moving to the next step, which is uh, starting the negotiations with the EU on the membership. Thank you. Thank you, Eka. Uh.
I hope it uh, it proves to be true, and we will move very soon uh, to the next st stage of uh, of the EU uh, integration. Uh, and uh, the fact that uh, candidate status was given as a credit uh, will disappear, and we will actually deserve uh, deserve the uh, promotion on this road uh, towards the European Union. Georgi, do we have a microphone in the audience? Um, please get ready for the questions because we don't have that much time left. So I won't, I won't exploit more time myself, and will be happy. I believe panelists will be happy to respond to, to the questions you might have. Any hands? Uh, hello, my name is Edward. Marika Shuli, I represent uh, National NGO Georgian Democracy Initiative. Um, I have one short question, um, and this question directs to Mr. Nicholas and our guest guests from uh, Ukraine. Um, and this question is about whistleblowers and about the protection steps taken in EU and Ukraine. Um, Mr. Nicholas, you mentioned the European Directive on the protection of whistleblowers, which uh, <coughs> has not been taken yet, uh, implemented yet in the EU. Um, and I'm interested in interested what steps are being taken by the civil society in the EU to encourage the implementation of the Directive by the member states. Um, and I'm also interested um, in the situation in Ukraine in terms of the protection of whistleblowers, because I think um, the whistleblowers plays a uh, huge role and important role fighting corruption. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, anyone else? If not, then... Uh uh, Nick, please respond to the question, and I also have a follow-up question to the concrete mechanisms that you can recommend for implementing all these policies that we've talked about, and starting with Rusudan, it will be important to hear what OECD uh, can can do in practical terms, uh, what is the global initiative run by other organizations and countries uh, to help us uh, in this process. Yeah, no, th thank you very much. And I, of course, agree that you know, the protection of whistleblowers is a, is a critical uh, element uh, of fighting corruption, uh, and which is why uh, it was very difficult, actually, to initiate the legislative steps to, to get the whistleblowing directive proposed originally. Uh, this was a long road uh, that took many, many years of garnering that initial political will and understanding of the importance of whistleblowers. Um, I was in a in a... A meeting years ago uh, with the European Commission and the European Parliament trying to make them understand that the member states didn't have these rules in place and that whistleblowers were coming forward and exposing wrongdoing and correspondingly getting prosecuted for whistleblowing. Um, and they essentially said that there was no legal base uh, under the treaties and uh, there was no political will in Brussels. Uh, but that changed over time and it changed over time because in the first instance um, we built a coalition, and not just of civil society actors. Uh, of course, we have recognized the importance of whistleblowers, but we sought out other stakeholders that, that had a role in, uh, in promoting and encouraging whistleblowing protections. And so we, uh, we teamed up with trade unions in Brussels. Um, trade unions who looked at this from an employment rights perspective and said that, you know, if you're exposing wrongdoing in the workplace, you should be protected. We teamed up with journalists who rightly viewed this as a freedom of expression issue uh, and making sure that uh, public interest was being served by having people be protected for exposing wrongdoing. Um, and with that coalition, we, uh, we I'd like to think, uh, helped inspire the political will to get the proposal. There was other factors involved, not least with the, uh, the emergence of Panama Papers uh, and, and, uh, and others. Uh, where the European Commission, I think, realized that they were uh, looking and finding loopholes in the system based on the reports of whistleblowers, uh, were acting on those uh, through the benefit of that knowledge, but also having those same whistleblowers be prosecuted. Uh, 
So indeed, we got the, the, the adoption of the directive, but the, the, the member states were, were quite, quite uh, negligent uh, in properly adopting it, not least because uh, for pe people in positions of power, it's unpopular uh, to have people exposing wrongdoing, particularly in, in, in the public field. The private sector, actually, we found were also an ally, not least because some of the multinationals who had to uh, operate uh, in the private sector already had huge systems in place, not least because they were compel compelled to by some U.S. laws uh, if they were operating abroad. Uh, and they didn't look at it really like a whistleblowing system. They looked at it as a proper compliance mechanism for the sound functioning of a business and to protect their financial interests, which it is as well. Um, I can't really speak to, I'll, leave, I'll let, I'll let, um, I'll let um, my, my, my colleagues from Ukraine uh, talk about uh, talk about their experience with whistleblowers, but here in, in, in the union, uh, we have continued the efforts through the building of uh, large multi-stakeholder coalitions to try and to, to get that, garner that political will in the 27 member states. So again, I'm working from Brussels, but also it really is a, you know, grassroots on the ground organizations in, in the 27 member states, working with civil society, working with trade unions, working with academics, working with journalists. Uh, because all of us, and also the private sector, uh, working to make sure that, again, uh, the, the member state governments uh, understand the importance of whistleblowing protection and actually follow through with their, their obligations under EU law to have those protections in place. Thank you, Nick. Ukraine, uh, whistleblowers. Uh, th thank, you. Th thank you for this question. And I'll, I will start, uh, start answering from the Ukrainian part side, and maybe Giza will. Uh, add from the practical uh, point what is going on uh, with the whistleblowers in Ukraine. But what we see, there is like two perspectives. First is legal framework. And the legal framework is in place in Ukraine. And uh, that's, that is great. But we have another uh, part, is implementation. The first problem, but what is the state of play? In Ukraine, there are around uh, 100 cases, whistleblower cases. Some of them, maybe few of them, are very public cases. The one case was really a change maker. It was the case of Oleg Polishuk. He was the anti-corruption officer in the big public energy company. And it showed that being even the anti-corruption officer, he needs years to prove that he is a whistleblower and that his right must be protected. And from one hand, it shows, it shows the holes in this system. Uh, first thing, the not, un not understanding what the Institute of Whistleblower is by Ukrainian like governmental officials, by even by the judges. So not just understanding uh, how to deal with whistleblowers, um, what rights they, uh, what their rights must be protected. So it's the problem of uh, understanding and of communication. The second thing is uh, for sure the communication. Yes. So we are um, the implementation is really poor because because of um, I think a bad communication and training of the uh, this institute to the both to the officials and to the uh, to the society so uh, to be honest Ukrainian parliament and Ukrainian government establishing the uh, law on the whistleblowers they, they started with uh, just that 10% uh, for whistleblower and I think it was a bad uh, communication strategy in fact you had they had to put resources in other understanding of this word and this institute. Unfortunately, many of uh, um, Ukrainians still understand whistleblowers, as I will tell it in, in, in Russian for, uh, because Georgians will understand it, Stukach, yes? So, and they still understand it as, as this, this, with this meaning. So, um, there are cases, we are moving forward, but there must be more resources put into the communication and the uh, understanding by the judges and changing the uh, case law in this particular um, particular topic and issue. 
Thank you, Tatiana. We don't really have that much time left or any time left for that matter, but um, I will definitely give the rest of the panelists a uh, um, couple of minutes maybe for the final remarks. Gizo, if you want to add something to it, and then Rusudan. Ahal Institute she derived the Ahal Institute da omis period var muksa sashole baro is bolu de da guenerga da gago khurtsele. Am kut khizalen aktur mushao bas orna tila chile ba gago khurtsele sa mushao erti romelits korupsiis prevensiis am sakhure khurtsele bas res monitoring sa khurtsele bas am dinat khte ba mati uplebe bizdat soda si shemde da is beori natsele romelits magalte tanam shonos nabus. Tanam <laughs> Rache, Heba, Piru, and Natural Somers at Sagan to Akatabs. Jerji Ruby, there are solos of Pupili Practica, Emperor of Shah to Zalesh Shira Chemko, so the Sats. A Mokalake, Borota di Eleben, I'm Institute Simitor, Mashan de Graz, Menichabat Status, Robisinari and Gagashi Sabdehebli, Matez Levat, Carcoli, Datsvis, Datsva, Carcoli, Plebe, Ezlevata. Salian Shiach was out of the Chem Toys, who sat at the Menevi Pactura through Das Menit, Arasu, Informatic Modern, Holo Dimitom, from Mi Rone Statuse, Argaushuan Samsa Huridanda, Assession. Magram Tower is Arisro, Sagam Dubaza Arsebos, Amkut Mushova Mimdinare of Ukraine, but thirty or the Luke is practical Dahu, it's also a scholar person, Prosul Public Nevis for Madlobam, Russo. Oh, well, with regard to the mechanism that OECD offers uh, for uh, EU integration path um, and strengthening the efforts against corruption, uh, our organization's slogan is better policies for better lives. And there are myriads of possibilities to be included in different uh, policy areas. It depends on the country, uh, country appetite for reforms and engagement with international partners. We have uh, obviously, enlargement countries are not members of the OECD, it's, uh, except for Turkey. Uh, and uh, these countries have the opportunity to be part of the global relations programs, uh, the memorandums of understanding that Ukraine has concluded, for example, with the OECD, Moldova, uh, etc. Um, there's also a way to come closer to, to, the, um, to becoming a member of the OECD. Uh, but for non-members, specifically on anti-corruption, there is anti-corruption network uh, for Eastern Europe and Central Asia, a regional initiative that has been there for over 25 years and uh, which has uh, recently innovated in its work program to make it very uh, enforcement or high-level corruption focused, but also try to deal with core difficult issues on a practical level, uh, moving away from laws uh, and institutions merely and going into how things uh, can be implemented in practice. Uh, there is a program of Istanbul Action Plan that is a monitoring program uh, that uh, was um, adopted uh, last year and uh, which, was, which is supported by European Union and the United States among others, but also the countries, members of the uh, anti-corruption network, they themselves provide membership fees to be part of the initiative um, and there are nine members at this point who undergo monitoring uh, based on indicators very concrete that provide also merit uh, the, the roadmap for, for, uh, for reforms uh, and the opportunity for countries to benchmark themselves against others and go further. But we have much more than the monitoring, <laughs> not to scare away um, countries. Um, the region is full of expertise of the recent uh, uh, OECD members that are also EU members, uh, for example, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania and others. But also we invite um, uh, OECD members around the table to share experience and have regional dialogue. The next regional dialogue will be about anti-corruption strategies and action plans and business integrity to incentivize also companies to uh, be engaged in anti-corruption uh, efforts. And this has been, the, especially anti-corruption policy, has been 
one of the EU enlargement homeworks for many of the countries. Uh, so the countries are encouraged to be part of this regional dialogue. And at the OECD, like it has been said uh, here, we believe in so-called whole of government or whole of society approach to fighting corruption. That's why we sit together with civil society in our plenary meetings to discuss things. And uh, uh, this gives an opportunity to challenge and uh, make um, uh, various stakeholders accountable to each other. Government, non-governmental organizations, both need to be uh, accountable to each other um, and this is the uh, forum that provides an opportunity. Another one very practical is the law enforcement network which is regional. Uh, uh, it's a gathering of uh, prosecutors and investigators that sit together and discuss concrete cases um, uh, as hypothetical cases engage in discussions and that has shown us that um, the international cooperation on concrete cases can emerge like joint investigative teams and um, countries sitting together discussing specific case and finding the ways uh, of cooperating on a specific trans-border uh, uh, corruption cases. This is key and that's also upcoming. Uh, there is a global one in June and there is in October, uh, Latvian Prosecutor General's Office is hosting our networks meeting. Uh, so that's an opportunity as well. And uh, the third one is about business integrity um, that, that has also a dedicated focus because this is a relatively new area in the region that has uh, also um, uh, been piloted uh, in, in the ACN network. And we have a business integrity group with the business ombudsman and relevant representatives, but also private sector sitting together discussing the key issues. Um, and um, I would like to conclude by saying that, uh, as we know, EU accession is a merit-based process. Uh, it's completely up to the countries and societies to work together towards this goal. Uh, and there's wealth of experience uh, available out there in international uh, forums and uh, the countries uh, are encouraged to make use of these resources that is made available. Thank you. Thank you, Rusudan. Sanaika, if you want to add. I, I know we're almost out of time, so I'll just mention, you know, in the United States, we have the Federal Whist Whistleblower Protection Act that was passed in 1989. Um, we have rather robust protection mechanisms throughout the United States. Um, and I think in the case of Georgia, what's important now is that the newly created Anti-Corruption Bureau has this mandate to create whistleblower protections um, that are ro more robust in this country. Um, they've asked to, to share U.S. experiences. We'll be happy to share our experiences. And I believe other international organizations as well will be sharing experiences. And I think that this um, bodes well for, for the future for Georgia. Okay, what, uh, what should be done? Yes, again, um, uh, like the, the title of this panel, we need the political will and the holistic approach, right? And so I should say that although those who are fighting for the democratic reforms here, we understand that we, first of all, we do this for our country and this is our homework and this, it is first of all good for our country. But sometimes, you know, it's good to have the incentives, like, um, for instance, the membership in the EU, so it helps. So, and it helps uh, uh, the assessment from our international partners helps and the um, concrete uh, requirements on democratic reforms helps. And uh, I think that this is also very important from one side to have the political will and the holistic approach from the government um, also have the uh, very active civil society and the citizens who are willing to uh, have better country and uh, push the government to implement the democratic reforms and anti-corruption reforms here and then at the same time to have the kind of incentives from our international partners that you know if we implement this we will get as a country something more so this is what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, Eka. Uh, thank you all for these wonderful presentations and uh, sharing your experiences, knowledge uh, to the audience. Please uh, help me to thank my panel for for um, <laughs> wonderful performance. And uh, I go back to Georgi. 
Thank you very much. Thank you to all presenters. It was personal for me. It was very interesting. Uh, and uh, I think those of your side share to the audience. Um, will use will be used uh, quite quite i think uh, good because because uh, these are the recommendations from your side that that's relevant to all the countries that we are focusing so i think uh, this is something that we really needed and you made it so thank you very much and once again please join me Tony. we'll have the 5 minute breaks before the uh, the second panel or yeah we we need to